everyone and welcome to the program of hands-on FNIRS for Motor and Auditorial Research. My name is Mariana Ceci and I will be your host for this lecture. This program was brought to you by the Santos Dumont Institute, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, the State University of Campinas, the University of São Paulo, the Federal University of ABC, Brain Support and RX Medical Technologies. Today, we are going to enjoy the lecture of Mrs. Judith Gervin, who is a professor at the Department of Developmental and Social Psychology at the University of Padova in Italy. She is trained as a theoretical linguist and obtained her PhD in Cognitive Neuroscience in 2002. Judith has worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of British Columbia in Canada and has conducted pioneer work in newborn speech perception using the near-infrared spectroscopy, revealing the prenatal experience of early perceptual abilities. She has also been the first one to document the beginnings of acquisition of grammar in newborns and proverbial infants. Let us all welcome Mrs. Gavin. Um, I'm going to be talking about the co-registration of uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy and EEG. So Sylvia just gave you an introduction to basic principles, methodological considerations. Uh, and as you know, NIRS is um, a relatively new technique, but gaining in popularity. Uh, and so the question of co-recording NIRS with other techniques um, is, is really interesting and highly relevant and becoming more and more popular, I would say. Uh, so this is a, a classical figure from a publication that looked at the use of uh, brain imaging techniques used with infants. So most of what I'm saying will be valid for any population because I will be talking about methodological considerations of NIRS and EEG. Uh, but my starting point is infants. I myself um, only do infant work, essentially. So what you can see here is a, a space with three dimensions. Uh, one dimension is the spatial resolution of different brain imaging techniques. Another dimension is the temporal resolution of brain imaging techniques. And the third dimension, which is also color coded, is how much infants or vulnerable populations, so you can replace this with uh, patients, adult patients, uh, or any other vulnerable population, uh, tolerate any of these methods. The darker the color, the worse it is tolerated. The lighter the color, the better it is tolerated. And so what you can see in, in this is that um, the different methodologies have different strengths and weaknesses. So the spatial resolution of some techniques are very good. So MRI, of course, give, gives these very spectacular um, images of the brain. And of course, for that reason, it's a really uh, popular technique. Um, the temporal resolution is higher in electrophysiological techniques. Um, so essentially, the temporal resolution does not only depend on the machine, but really on the type of neural, the type of response that is being measured. So electrophysiological techniques, EEG, electroencephalography, and MEG, magnetoencephalography, measure the neural response directly. And so they have a resolution in the millisecond range because this is the sort of the temporal resolution of the neural response. Whereas other techniques like NIRS, MRI, and others measure a metabolic correlate, so the hemodynamic response or some other metabolic correlate. These responses themselves are much slower. The resolution is in the second range, not in the millisecond range. And so this makes these techniques slower. So it's not just the machines. We are not just talking about the machines, but really the physiology that's behind. And so what you can see is that um, NIRS and EEG actually seem to have complementary strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and uh, so with the spatial resolution of NIRS being higher, localization in NIRS is accurate, whereas it is not in EEG, and vice versa, the temporal resolution of EEG is, uh, as we just said, is in the millisecond range, whereas NIRS measures responses in the second range. So it makes a lot of sense to combine these two te techniques because they complement each other in terms of spatial and temporal resolution. And as you can see in the figure, they are both yellow, which means they are both well tolerated by participants. So they can be easily used in infants or other vulnerable uh, groups or populations. So the combination has uh, several advantages. Uh, uh, the main motivation is that uh, they are complementary, as we just said. So the two together provide 
good um, good approximation or good measures of both the temporal and the spatial dynamics of brain activity. Uh, obviously, also, uh, they do not interfere, so this is very important. Um, the ears, nearest and EEG can be measured together uh, because one is an optical, the other is an, uh, an electric measure. They do not interfere with one another. There is no issue of, say, magnetic components or me metallic components, which would be a difficult event for registering, for example, with fMRI. Um, also importantly, and this you will see later, uh, they are easily combinable physically in the same headgear. Um, so we can just use the same cap and then put uh, nearest optodes and EEG electrodes into the same cap. Uh, and both techniques, as we discussed, are very easy to use. They're much more participant friendly and experimenter friendly than, say, RI, really, um, sort of constraining or heavy technique. So this is an illustration of an old setup I had in my lab a few years ago uh, on a doll. So this is not a newborn, but it's the size of a newborn participant. And what you can see is the co-registration. So uh, in dark, in black, here on the side and here, you see mirrors of tones. And these in white, plus the brown, the black one here, are easy electrodes. So you can see that they nicely, neatly fit in exactly the same cap, so the two can be co-registered together. Um, they are a bit more cumbersome in the sense that there are more wires and cables hanging all over the place, but they can easily be placed in the same cap. This is, a um, again, a co-registration uh, with an older infant, so this is a newborn lying uh, on their backs. This is an older infant, so sitting on the parent's lap. Again, you can see the nears, optodes, and the EEG electrodes. Some more of the same baby, so those that have light are the EEG electrodes in this particular setup. So th these are the obvious advantages. This is my favorite one. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is the difficulties, because obviously, as much as this seems attractive, there are uh, a number of challenges when doing it uh, to actually for recording the two techniques. So to be able to sort of um, to illustrate the, the difficulties or the challenges, I will take you through three studies that were run in my lab. So in a certain sense, this is my lab's learning curve about co-registering these two techniques. And the three studies are on completely different topics. So in terms of the scientific questions, the story is not coherent. They are very different studies. And I will have to explain at least the basics of the research questions so you understand the paradigms. So I will ask for your sort of patience and, uh, and I ask you to bear with me because the questions are some, sometimes maybe far away from your own background but it will be necessary to illustrate the difficulties and then also potential solutions. So these are the three studies by now, they're all published. The first one is actually with Sylvia. So um, the person you just um, heard talking before uh, and then the other two are uh, with different co-authors. I will describe each study uh, as we go along. Once again, because the research questions may be different from what you're interested in or difficult to understand, I really encourage you to um, to ask questions um, as, as we go along so that you understand really the motivations for the different designs and then what challenges uh, these bring to the co-registration. So the first study with Sylvia was done quite a few years ago. Um, and what we were interested in is learning word order. So um, I work on the early acquisition of language. So how very young babies, newborns, and the first first birthday, let's say, so during the first year of life, how babies start to learn about their native language. When you think about learning language, one very obvious property of language is that words come in a specific order. And this is different from one language to another. So if you think about English and Portuguese, there are already some differences, but then other languages, say Turkish or Japanese, would have even more different word orders. So in some languages, you would say you would put the verb first and then the object, or eat an apple, whereas in other languages you would say the opposite, apple, eat, which would be the case, say, in Japanese or Turkish. Uh, and it seems to be the case that children figure this out very quickly. So when they start to produce more than one word, so their first multi-word utterance is at around age one and a half to three, at 
actually reflect the, the word order correctly. So um, an English speaking baby would say something like eat cookie, whereas a Japanese speaking baby would eat, say something like cookie eat. Um, and it was shown in behavioral work that we, that we have done that already at eight months so before they can produce words, infants are sensitive to word order in their native language. They can choose whether their native language is more Japanese-like or more English-like. And actually, in a, an older behavioral study, it was shown that even two-month-old infants have some ability to learn sequences of words and notice if word order is violated. So this is not the native language in particular, just a series of words. You present a series of words to the babies, uh, you repeat it a couple of times so they learn the order, and then you violate it, so you move words around, and the question is whether they can notice the change. And it seemed to be the case that at two months they can already do that. So with Sylvia, what we were wondering about is whether this ability is there at birth. So this is something that's there at the beginning or not, because as we said, word order is so basic for language, right? So the moment you want to put together words, like here, you have to go from left to right, whether in speech or writing. And so you have to decide in what order you put them. Without this, there is no language. So this is a basic ability. We wanted to know whether it's there at birth. Uh, we tested two groups of participants. Uh, essentially, the details here are not very important. They are exposed to French prenatally, so this, uh, these studies were done in Paris, um, and they were full-term newborns tested at the hospital. So as you can see, when I say newborn, I really mean newborn. These are babies that are tested one, two, three days after birth. And we had two separate um, studies in terms of the issue of core registration, it doesn't matter whether we consider the first or the second study. So I'll just, you know, I'll just show you the second one, say, for the sake of the example. So what we did was, just like in the previous study with two-month-olds, we um, created strings of words. So these are French words put together in a sequence. They are not necessarily grammatical in French. They don't necessarily... The words themselves are real French words, but the way we put them together is not necessarily a real sentence. These are just sequences of words. And so we present the words, the, the sequence of four words, once, twice, three times, identically. So it's a repetition of the same sequence three times. I will call a repetition of three identical sequences a standard block. So this is a standard block or standard file. Every standard trial was followed by a deviant trial. So here we have two repetitions that are again identical, but then there is a violation in the third repetition. So you can see that words one and two were um, switched around. So we violate the original order, and we want to know whether newborns uh, actually recognize this. So whether they detect this change. And so, I need to make you listen to the stimuli just so that you get an idea. Et appel doit aller. These are French words. Et aller appel. You could hear probably that these are the same words, just that the first two are changed. Sometimes it's the second and the third, so it's not necessarily on the first word. Okay, so then what did we do? And here comes the issue of core registration. So, as I said, we call this standard and deviant law. And we use NEARS to measure the response to the standard and deviant blocks. Uh, but we also use NEED to measure uh, the responses to the first word or whichever word was critical for the change. So for this example I showed you, if right here you can notice the change, the violation. If the um, violation came, so if it was the second and the third word that were interchanged, then the violation was measured in EEG here. So the issue was with NEARS, we measured the larger blocks, and with EEG, we measured the response to the specific item that was standard or violating the order. Obviously, this comes from the fact that NEARS, as we said, measures a slow response. So it needs a longer stimulation block, several seconds, for the response to develop. EEG is fast, it measures neural response at the millisecond range. So it measures short, brief individual events. So what we tried uh, to do was the, right, measure near and EEG this way. And here is what we got. 
Oh, sorry, yes, the setup, this is the same doll as the one you saw before. This is a, maybe a, a, a more sort of topologically better illustration. The numbers here indicate nearest channels. So red are nearest sources, blue are nearest detectors. These are nearest channels. So a coupling of a source and the detector is a channel. And, um, and so we had uh, uh, eight channels on each hemisphere for NIRS, and these are the EEG um, electrodes. These are standard 1020 localization. So we can see them here too, right? So uh, these are the, the NIRS channels, EEG. And so this is the actual set setup we used for the study with this um, doll. Uh, I'm going to skip now the analysis details. We can go back to it if you want. For both NIRS and EEG, we use totally standard analysis criteria from the literature. And so here's what we got. In the first experiment, and we can just stick with that for now, one, what you can see is, remember there were standard and deviant blocks. And remember, sorry, I'm going to go back to, to the positions. So I'm going to be plotting the channels following this layout just that we will not be looking at it from the top, but rather from the ear, from the side. So this will be shown as the top of the, the figure because it's the top of the head. Um, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. So channels 1 to 12 on the left and then 14 to 23 on the right. Okay. So here are the channels of the left hemisphere, right hemisphere. And remember, this is the top of the head the ear is here, and this is frontal, so the, the nose is pointing outwards. And this is a mirror image, so top of the head, ear, and the nose would be pointing outwards. So this is the right piece here. Um, okay. And so then the, uh, the channels show the average response across blocks and across babies of a given condition. So standard, remember these are the standard blocks where the sequence was repeated identically three times. This, this is the continuous line, red for oxyhemoglobin, blue for the oxyhemoglobin. And the, the dashed line is the deviant uh, condition. So where there's a violation at the end, uh, these are again pinkish uh, for oxy, bluish for the oxy. And so what you can see is that in a number of channels, you have a greater response to the deviant than uh, to the standard. So this suggests that the babies did detect the change, the violation, and responded more strongly to the deviant conditions. So this in itself suggests that um, they are able to encode word order. Now let's look at the EEG results. So remember, the EEG results uh, are time-locked to the beginning of the word, which indicates the violation. So this is the deviant word, and this is the standard word, either at the beginning of the standard block or at the beginning of um, the, the, in the inside the deviant block. So let me go back to the arrows, right? So this is compared to the same position when it's standard within its own block or to the same position when it's standard in the standard one. Okay, so these are the three curves I'm showing. What you can see is that it's all flat. There is really not much. Uh, and the same is true for the second study. I'm not going to go into the details. Again, the EEG is much less informative than the nearest response. Well, why is that? The reason for this is, if you think about it, um, there, there are sort of two issues uh, that need to be taken into account. One issue is that um, the difference between the, the words themselves might be, in a certain sense, too small for the EEG to pick up, in the sense that these are the, all the words are familiar to the infant, right? It's just the order that itself that is uh, violated here. And so it may be the case that just the familiarity of the words is sufficient somehow for the EEG responses to look similar 
DG responses do not pick up on the, the order, the more general or higher, higher level of organization. So by looking at the larger um, stimulation unit, a block, rather than individual words, and the DG response was able to reflect uh, structural properties, where he's looking at individual words, the EEG did not. Another thing is that um, these are, as you could hear in the, in the example, these are sequences where the words are stringed together. So it's continuous. Now, the issue then is that uh, whenever the second or the third word was the violation, then there is no sign, there is no baseline to take our EUP on, and so the response might be contaminated um, by the previous word. So it looks like um, we, are, we have different sensitivities to nearest and EEG. Um, another thing that you could see potentially in the EEG data is, especially in a few of the channels, is that it's quite a bit noisy. Uh, that's also another thing that um, differs between the two techniques to some extent, because nearest is more tolerable than in what does that mean? That really means that as long as the cap stays in place with respect to the head, the rest of the body can move. Um, now, this is not true for EG in the sense that EG picks up on the muscle activity of motion. So say if the, the arm is moved or the head is moved, um, even if the EEG sensors themselves, the electrodes, stay in place as compared to the nearest uh, sensors, or as compared to the head, I'm sorry, the EEG sensors are sensitive to the electric um, discharges and changes in potential that co-occur with muscle activity. And so EEG is more sensitive to, to motion. So there are a series of differences that made it such that uh, with nearest, we could show that maybe are able to track word order. But the paradigm, because of different emotion tolerance, because of differences in the design, uh, did not allow us to pick up the same using the EEG. Okay, so that's one study. Now we are moving on to another study. This is uh, with Rens Hufmeyer, the, the experimenter uh, that you see, and this is the concrete study I'm going to be talking about. Now this is with eight-month-old babies. Again, a very similar configuration, potentially a few more EEG electrodes. In this one, again, about language, uh, we were wondering uh, about young infants' ability to perceive prosody, and especially the emotional valence included in prosody. So a lot has been done about prosody is the sort of the intonation, the musicality, rhythm, and melody of language. And um, this has been studied quite a lot in language acquisition because in a certain sense, if you wish, this is the packaging of spoken language, right? We cannot say anything with flat prosody. This is what robots produce, humans never produce flat prosody. This is how language comes to us. Um, and it's very helpful. It has been shown that prosody helps a lot in learning grammar, learning words, learning many things. But prosody does not only carry linguistic information, it also carries emotional information, for example, or the identity of the speaker, uh, female versus male voice, etc. In particular, we were asked whether eight month olds are able to distinguish between happy and angry prosody in language, and whether this has to do with the type of parenting, the type of environment that they grew up in. So is it is the is infant's ability to distinguish between happy and angry prosody dependent on their mother's parenting style? Of course, with the idea that somehow um, different parenting styles use emotional prosody differently, so more intrusive parents would use angry, angry prosody more often, uh, more, uh, say, responsive or reactive parents might use uh, both or more happy prosody. And so we, collect, we collected data from mother-infant diets. We measured the mother's parenting style in an observational setting. And then we did it in to measure uh, infants' responses to sentences with happy and angry prosody. So here the design was very simple. We had blocks, again measured through nears, uh, of 
sentences with either angry or happy prosody. So these were again French uh, sentences. Let me just um, show you some of the happy prosody sentences. These are very simple, typically imperatives that are very often used with babies. So something like, um, help me, uh, calm down, sit down, come here, give it to me, etc., etc. And these are things that could easily be changed or said either with happy or with angry prosody. So this is the happy condition. Aide-moi. Calme-toi. So these are happy sentences, as you could also potentially hear, even if you did not necessarily understand or don't understand French. And the exact same sentences were produced by the same female voice using angry prosody in the angry condition. Now, as before, the larger blocks were measured using nears, and we also measured the EEG response to single sentences. So each one of the either happy or angry sentences. Right, so all of these. The configuration is very, very similar to the previous one, except that we added a few more EEG channels, simply because these babies were not lying on their backs, but rather were sitting, and so we had more space on the head, and uh, we could use more, uh, more channels. So you can see that there are EEG channels in the back of the head as well. And so these are the results. Uh, what you can see is the difference curve between angry and happy prosody. So essentially the point is that in the front of the head, so in the frontal, central, frontal, temporal um, sites, uh, the response, the difference between angry and happy prosody is not flat, right? So when we have a response like this, it means that the response to angry and uh, happy prosody are the same. If you take the difference, then we get nothing, zero. But this is not the case in these frontal sites, and this is where typically we find language-related or speech processing related effects in infants. Uh, so we were happy. Now you can see not the difference curve, but rather the, the responses of the two curves. So you see that when they, they are very similar, then their difference would be flat, uh, so zero, uh, but they could be quite different. And so what we found was that those babies whose mothers were less intrusive could distinguish between happy and angry prosody. Um, those babies whose mothers were more intrusive showed the, the, uh, the same response to happy and angry prosody. And there was a correlation between a score of intrusiveness. This is measured by analyzing the videos of how mothers interact with, with their babies using standard procedures. So there was a correlation between a, the score of maternal inclusiveness and the EEG response of the difference curve. So, if you take the difference when it's zero, um, then it means that there's no, that the babies respond similarly to angry and happy. There is no difference between angry and happy. Uh, then this uh, score is different from zero. Then uh, actually we see a different response. So as you can see uh, here, a greater response to happy than to angry positive. So the EEG worked out pretty well in this particular study. Uh, these are the nearest responses. They are shown in this funny way because they sort of imitate the position on the head. So remember, they are kind of um, here on the side on the temporal parietal, somewhat frontal regions. So this is this, the topological map. And as you can see, first of all, the data is a bit noisier, but especially that there is not much of a difference between happy and angry. And one thing you could notice is that the response to oxygenated hemoglobin is more negative. So you see that instead of oxy going up, the oxy going down, as it is normal, as is the standard hemodynamic response, what we have here is an inverted response. And um, so again, it seems that the two measures actually don't pick up on the same thing, uh, while EEG is sensitive to the difference in processing between happy and angry. Um, nearest is not. And in particular, we find an inverted response. The reason for the in, in, inverted response is uh, potentially in the sort of the time scale and sensitivity of the two measures. So um, now again, going back to the paradigm, you will see that nearest measures the response to many, many different, many sentences uh, together. And so maybe the response did not pick up on the fact that there is something common to all of them. 
namely that they are happy or that they are angry. Also, and this is what the inverted response really suggests, the inverted response is often interpreted as habituation. That is, um, and this is standard for any sort of neural response. This is not specific to NIRS, but really happens in EEG, MRI, or uh, anything of the sort. Once you present a stimulus repeatedly, the neural response decreases. It gets smaller and smaller. And so what seems to be the case is that the, the near signal is picking up on this habituation response. It gets inverted because the response to all these different sentences is smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's as if, again, the, the nearest, because it looks at a larger scale, sort of looks at this habituation or the result of the habituation. So by the end of the block, with all these different repetitions of the sentences, the nearest response just gets diminished. So again, as we said, the, the study was successful in that it, is, it established that uh, babies are able to discriminate between happy and uh, angry prosody to the extent that uh, their, uh, let's say, parenting style or the parenting style of the mother um, allows them to experience happy and angry prosody differently. Uh, but we also see that we obtain results only in one modality, not in the other. And so finally, a third study, uh, which obviously, as you can imagine, after having two studies in which either the NIRS or the, the EEG, but only one kind of succeeds and the two show different things, um, I really felt challenged. And so when we set out to do this study with Lauriane Cabrera, um, we really thought very hard and carefully about finding a paradigm that would be suitable for the two. So essentially, if, um, here the question is, this, this is very technical. I really, you really don't need, need to get all the details, but just uh, if you've seen a speech signal, then you know that the speech signal is what's called a modulated carrier signal. So uh, this is the fundamental frequency, so the oscillation of the vocal cords. And this is modulated, you can see this modulation in amplitude, which is called the speech envelope, right? So this signal you can decompose into the modulation of the envelope of the amplitude called the envelope and the fine structure, which is the modulation of the frequency. So the basic carrier and the frequency modulation. Uh, this only matters to the extent, and I think that's something that you might be interested in. This matters to the extent that um, this kind of decomposition um, is important for how we hear, and in particular, how um, hearing impairment um, can be conceived of. So uh, the perception of the envelope or the perception of the fine structure can be... Uh, differently impaired in different um, deaf or hard of hearing populations. And also uh, this kind of decomposition is what um, cochlear implants perform. And so by degrading the speech signal, by suppressing more and more information, we can simulate what cochlear implant, implant users perceive. And so the question of this study uh, was once we degrade the speech signal to simulate um, what cochlear implants might transmit, uh, is it still the case that the signal is good enough such that babies can perform a discrimination of two consonants? So I will come to the details um, of the stimuli which might be important interesting for you later, but we know that in adults, so this is our sort of basic question, we know that in adults, the slow temporal envelope, so just this modulation in itself, if you get rid of the fine structure, just the modulation of the envelope itself is sufficient for speakers to understand uh, speech in silence. In noise, it's no longer the, the case, but in silence at least, it is sufficient to just have the envelope. So this slow modulation of amplitude. 
And so what we wanted to know whether this was also the case developmentally, right? Uh, obviously, adults are very experienced speakers of a language, so they understand language under very degraded conditions, right? So very often, indeed, now that we are always on Zoom, um, and um, there are, just as you had with Sylvia, there are very often problems in the signal. Um, it, is, it is the case that we tolerate distortions of the signal quite well, or if I have a flu or a cold and I speak with a blocked nose, you would still more or less get what I mean. Your adults are very good at guessing the speech signal. But of course, infants don't have this experience. They have a, a small vocabulary or at the beginning, nothing, no vocabulary, no grammar, nothing. Do they still perceive the speech signal on the basis of the envelope only? And so again, we tested newborns in this study. Uh, they were French exposed babies. And so here is, here is the trick. This is really what is important about this study. Um, learning from the, the previous two studies, we knew that trying to use near sign EEG to measure the same thing is extremely challenging because underlyingly they actually don't measure the same thing, right? So NIRS measures a hemodynamic correlate, so the blood oxygenation that accompanies um, neural activity, whereas EEG measures the neural activity itself. So since they don't measure the same thing, then in, a, in, a, in an experimental paradigm, we try to get the same response using the two methods, that is kind of difficult, as we have seen. So what we decided here is really to use Nearsen EEG not to measure the same thing, but rather two different things, such that it's complementary. So essentially, in a certain sense, we designed two experiments in one, if you wish. So what we had were three conditions in which we had very simple syllables, ta or pa, in, uh, in an intact way. So normal ta, normal pa. In another condition, we kept both the fast and the slow modulations of the envelope, but we suppressed the fine structure. So going back to this, we kept all of this, but suppressed this. And in the third condition, which I will call the slow envelope condition, we only had the very slow modulations of the envelope. And so the signal gets more and more degraded. This is intact, so not degraded. This is somewhat degraded. This is very strongly degraded. And this actually is similar to what cochlear implant, implant users might hear. So this study has kind of clinical relevance beyond just near study recording or speech processing in general. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that now. I'm focusing on the method. Uh, Right, and so we had these three conditions, and we were interested in how the brain responds to the three conditions to try and understand how similar is a, the processing of a degraded signal to the processing of a normal signal, knowing that this, is, this degraded signal is the one that, say, a cochlear implant user might have, and so this is what they can rely on to learn language. Within each of these large blocks, we had um, smaller blocks uh, lasting about 30 seconds. And so this is what uh, we used. An entire block like this is what we used uh, to measure the nearest response. So, so far, the logic is the same as before. We need long, large blocks for nears. But now, the thing was that we use nears uh, to compare simply these three conditions. But within a block of a given condition, we also introduced a new paradigm. It wasn't simply just a repetition of the same things as before. But here we introduce what is called the oddball paradigm in EEG. This is a very classical EEG paradigm. And what you can see is that inside a single block, what we had was the repetition of a standard syllable, pa, 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 many times. And then every now and then, as you can see in pink here, there was a, a different syllable, ta. This is the deviant or the oddball 
pa 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 ta pa 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 ta pa pa and so on, and so forth this in itself presenting a lot of the same and then every now and then a different thing is a classical eeg paradigm and so what we did was we implemented this inside the nearest block and so what we measured with eeg was actually the the responses to the standard and deviant so this is what's typically called a, a mismatch response in the in the EEG literature. And so if you wish that now we measure two different things. Uh, with EEG, we measured baby's ability to discriminate between pa and ta. And with NIRS, we measured, and this of course in the three different conditions. So we knew that newborns could discriminate pa and ta in the intact speech signal. We know that newborns can discriminate different consonants. But the question was whether they could still discriminate it in the fast and the slow condition. And then we used NIRS to, re to measure the, the difference in how the brain processes the fast and the slow conditions as compared to the impact one in general, irrespective of whether it's tower or power or whatever. Okay, so essentially these are really two studies in one. One is a basic discrimination study of consonants, and the other is a study of how babies process um, degraded speech signals. And so now what we got was, remember, we really are using your and EG kind of separately, if you wish. And so what we got was significantly different responses uh, to the three that impact fast and slow conditions using NIRS, so you can see here nicely, uh, for example, in this one, these two, that the intact and fast conditions, so those two that are less degraded, are processed differently than the more degraded slow condition. And this is true both in the right and the left hemisphere. So this in itself, we know that the brain, the newborn brain is sensitive to the amount of information. So whether the speech signal is degraded or not, whether it contains only slow modulations of the envelope or the full signal. But now the, with the EEG, sorry, the, the colors are the same as before, so deviant and standard. Um, what we could see on top of that in the three different conditions is that, as you can see, first of all, the EEG signal looks sort of it has a nice shape as it should. Uh, and what we can see is that there is a difference in all of the conditions between the standard and the deviant. So now this allows us to answer a second question, namely whether they can discriminate two different phonemes. And of course, in the intact condition, we, this is the baseline. We expected this um, to be the case so that your words can discriminate uh, pa and pa and the, ta, so pa and ta in the two separate, in the, in the intact condition. And so if this didn't work, then we would have concluded that the, the, the study or the discrimination um, just failed methodologically, but luckily we found it. And so this gave, gave us confidence that then what we see in the slow and fast conditions, which again was discrimination, uh, is a reliable uh, result. So we concluded that ta and pa can be discriminated irrespective of the condition. And so um, here, the, the, the important thing was, so first, theoretically, we, could, we showed that uh, just like adults, newborn babies can also rely on just simply the envelope to make fine-grained linguistic discriminations. Uh, but we also showed using, so that was what we could show using EEG, but using NIRS, we could show that although they can make, do this, make this discrimination in all of the conditions, the brain regions that are involved, or the brain responses, not so much the regions, the brain responses that are involved are different. The brain processes these conditions differently. And so in a certain sense, for me, the sort of the lesson learned from this study was that um, a good bet is to actually um, use NIRS and EEG in a potentially complementary fashion, um, relying on or sort of being led by the different temporal requirements of the two. So EEG is fast and is very good at measuring event-related responses. NIRS is more global. It's slow and measures a larger um, sort of involvement or effort um, of the brain. And so if the, the experimental design takes this into account, then it is actually better 
um, so you, one is able to get um, more information, more results, and more more reliable um, data from from the studies. So to wrap up, uh, near send EEG core recording is possible, and of course it's highly relevant because of their complementary nature. So precisely that EEG measures um, temporal, it, like in, with high temporal resolution, near with high spatial resolution. At the same time, it is challenging to core record the two, first and foremost, because they measure different physiologies. One measures a neural response, the other measures um, a hemodynamic response. And so these two are not the same things underlyingly. As a result, this actually means that the two uh, methods have different time courses. And so they, these different time courses place different constraints on the experimental designs that you can conceive. Uh, and in, in addition, their tolerance to uh, noise, motion, artifacts, etc., are uh, also different. And so that also results in something that's um, that's yet another challenge in data analysis, namely for both NIRS and EEG, for any kind of imaging, obviously, one needs to uh, pre-process the data, meaning filter, etc., but also reject um, artifacted data, noise. So certain trials, certain babies get rejected. It may be the case that those ba that some babies get rejected because they don't have good NIRS data. Other babies get rejected because they don't have good EEG data. And so in the final samples, when you analyze the NIRS data and when you analyze the EEG data, you end up with different groups of babies. Certainly there is going to be an overlap, but these are not exactly the same babies sometimes. And so that, of course, is an additional challenge when you compare the two results, because you're really actually not looking at uh, the same group of participants sometimes. And of course, if the difference is one or two babies, that um, uh, is not a big deal, but you could end up with um, having a group of 20 babies in NIRS, a group of 20 babies in EEG, except that only 10 babies are, so half of the group is the same, and the other half of the group is, are different babies. It's very hard to interpret the data then. So this is an additional challenge. Um, so with this, I thank you very much for your attention, and um, I would very much like to um, have your questions. Thank you very much for your lecture, Mrs. Given. We are now following up with the questions from the audience. The first one was posed by Sheila Ballen, who is a postdoctoral researcher here at the Santos Dumont Institute. She asks, Professor Gaven, is it necessary that in the presentation of stimuli, there is always a sequence of deviant stimuli? Why? Just in babies or all the auditory experiments? Thank you. No, no, absolutely not. So the, the, this kind of standard deviant is, uh, is commonly used precisely because you, you want to sort of um, understand babies' discrimination abilities, right? And this allows uh, the experimenter to detect small differences in discrimination. But say, think about the happy and angry prosody. There, there was no deviant or standard. That was the comparison of two conditions. So it's not, a, it's only one um, experimental option or one design option um, commonly used in EEG and behavior, a, a bit less commonly used in NIRS. Um, but it is not the only possibility. It's absolutely possible to, to design experiments with, with different paradigms. Amazing. Uh, thank you very much for your answer, Mrs. Given. We are now following up with the question from José Libra Soroto. She asks, the acquisition of the syntax is a huge challenge for hard of hearing children. Can we assume that the sensitive period that we are usually lost until the baby is ready to wear hearing aids determine this difficulty? Can we hypothesize that the process to organize words for this population has a different pattern due to the auditory perception? Thank you. Auditory perception. Right. So, um, indeed. So, I think the, the crucial thing here is as the question uh, was itself uh, suggesting, is the critical period. So the earlier um, you put a hearing aid or implant, a cochlear implant um, to a child, the, the less it loses of this critical time period. And so 
um, in a certain sense, there are two things to separate. One is just speech perception itself, and then the learning of abstract language, right? So words and grammar. But obviously, a child that does not sign um, and only relies on the speech input, but is deaf or hard of hearing, so does not actually get the proper speech input, has a much harder time to figure out the, 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 the rest, right? And so this is why to restore hearing in one way or another uh, within the critical period uh, allows the child to then access grammar. So what we know is that once they get speech, the speech signal, so once uh, hearing is restored, then their development follows the same steps. So once they hear the signal, then they learn the grammar in roughly the same way as normally hearing children do. So it's not that they learn grammar differently, it's just that their problems come from the fact that they don't get an input for too long. And so their brains are no longer as able to learn. It's no longer as plastic. Okay, so this is the end of our lecture. We hope you guys have enjoyed. And please don't forget to subscribe to the Santos Dumont Institute's YouTube channel so that you can have access to other contents related to neuroscience, neuroengineering, and scientific research. Thank you. Thank you.